All right. Well, thank you very much. We'll transition to our first science speaker, uh, Jackie Fulvio, who's been using CHTC for several years at this point. She'll probably talk a little bit about that. Um, but Jackie, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and hand it to you. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? All right. Uh, great. All right. So thank you for inviting me today. Uh, this is a little bit different from what I'm used to speaking about. Normally we talk very sciencey. So I'll try to kind of keep it uh, straightforward from the science perspective and really tell you how we were able to um, take advantage of these resources that Lauren just described to have some success in, um, in our work that we weren't actually expecting would actually happen. So our research focuses on visual working memory. And this is the brain process that allows us to temporarily maintain and manipulate visual information in order to solve a task. So we use our working memory all the time, including as you're sitting here listening to talks, you're using it. But I just want to give you an example of the type of task that requires working memory in the laboratory, uh, specifically one that we use to give rise to the data that we've been analyzing with the high throughput computing. So it's called a double serial retrotune task, and it goes something like this. We have a research participant come into the laboratory, they sit at a computer, and they focus their eyes on a white uh, cross on the screen, and then they get to see two items, which we call a sample. In this case, the sample is comprised of a face uh, image and a set of moving dots. So in this case, they're moving sort of up and to the right. And we tell participants, you need to remember the, the sample information because you're going to be tested on your memory for it later. So there's a delay period. It's rather long, five seconds. So they just continue looking at that white cross and they keep these items in mind. And then a retro cue comes up very briefly. In this case, it's a dashed line and you can see it's uh, positioned below the cross. And that tells the participant that we are going to test them on the item that was shown below the cross, in this case, the moving dots. We call this a prioritization cue because in your memory, you're prioritizing the information that occurred below the cross and you're sort of putting aside the information that occurred above it. But you don't want to forget it because you still might need it later. So then there's another delay period and then there's the test. You'll notice this little lightning bolt here uh, in the delay period. And that corresponds to uh, what we call transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS delivery. So TMS is just, a, in our case, a single pulse, a uh, magnetic pulse to the scalp. It doesn't actually feel like a shock. We use the lightning bolt just to depict it. it. Most people say it feels more like a little flick. But essentially, TMS is used to alter brain uh, function, and we look at corresponding uh, impacts. At the same time, we're also recording EEG. So we, we're recording uh, participants' brain waves. At test, participants simply indicate whether the item is uh, a match or non-match to the original sample item. And then the process repeats one more time in the trial. So they receive another cue. In this case, they're being tested on the same item again. On half of the trials, it actually switches and they're tested on the other item. And then there's another delay with a TMS pulse and a response. Okay, uh, so, um, that particular task, the double serial retrocue task, has many variations, the different nature of the stimuli that we use. Sometimes it's recorded with uh, EEG and TMS. Sometimes we do this in the fMRI scanner. Sometimes it's just behavioral data. Um, but in particular, in our case, with the concurrent EEG recording and TMS pulses, as the participant does the tasks, it allows us to address questions related to the role of neural oscillations in working memory. Uh, so we're recording the EG, the, you get a raw signal that looks something like this. We have 60 channels or 60 electrodes. And then when we process the data it, uh, into different frequencies, we get neural oscillations, which many are more familiar with maybe as brain waves. And so the frequency of neural oscillations has been associated with distinct working memory processes. And it's also been shown that there are Q-dependent effects, so when we show that little dashed line, and there are also TMS-dependent effects, so when we deliver the magnetic pulse. And so in our current work, we want to uh, 
investigate the role of these neural oscillations, and we chose to leverage an analysis called spatially distributed phase coupling extraction with a frequency specific phases model. Okay, we'll just call it SPACE for short or SPACE FSP. Uh, so this uh, particular analysis is a multi-way decomposition of the high dimensional EEG data. So we have 60 channels um, happening over an uh, recording over an extended period of time over many trials. And so the reason why we're interested in applying this method is that standard analyses do not adjudicate between oscillations arising from frequency modulation of, of a single network or multiple oscillating networks at different frequencies. So basically, are there many networks that have all these different brain waves or is it, are the effects coming from a single network? And so the, this analysis can do that. And so our goal was to extract phase coupled oscillatory networks in our data and basically look at how they respond in relation to different aspects of the task, so queuing or TMS pulses. And without going into great detail of the method, I will point out that it still remains a largely unused approach uh, in, the, in the field, but it does offer significant advantages over other methods. In particular, it's not subject to non-physiological constraints. So one likely reason why this approach has not taken off it is, is because it's a very computationally demanding analysis. And that's where uh, uh, high throughput came in for us. So the procedure comprises a parallel factor analysis based uh, signal decomposition method, but the number of networks that can be decomposed cannot be determined analytically and must be estimated through decomposition. And so to find the optimal decomposition, we have to do this iteratively. So we set a sort of statistical criterion, and then we um, started a set number of networks and we keep decomposing until uh, and increasing the number of networks incrementally until we no longer achieve our criterion. So as a result, uh, this, a single decomposition can take days to weeks to months, depending upon the amount of data uh, used for the decomposition, um, the number of networks that are ultimately extracted and the hardware running the analysis. And in advance, we plan to decompose at least 186 data sets. So we had many uh, sets of data from EEG data collected over a couple of different studies that we wanted to decompose. So this seemed insurmountable. <laughs> um, but we had the opportunity here to run decompositions in parallel so we could run one data set um, you know, on our server at a single time, but we could potentially run all of these at once. Uh, we, were all, we also had the opportunity to potentially take advantage of the MATLAB parallel com pool compatibility, which helps divvy up the, the uh, processing, as we'll talk about in a second. So uh, Lauren already kind of went through the process, but the way we got started was that our lab actually had a history of using the resources, although it was before my time. So my supervisor suggested, why don't we set up a meeting and see if we can make this happen. And so we did, we came in and we uh, consulted with the staff, discussed some basic details. And we knew this was going to still be a challenge uh, because of the nature of the analysis, which I'll get back to in a few moments. Um, but we got started. I have a fairly extensive coding history. So I found the online help guides to be especially helpful in getting the submit files ready and everything else. But I did need to have some office hour visits because I hit some snags when compiling my code to run. And I got some useful tips um, from the staff in terms of figuring out what was going wrong and what I needed to fix. Okay. So we had initially run our first um, analysis on our own lab server just to make sure everything was functional. And then we even did a test job or two on the high throughput. But once everything got going, we had uh, compiled through the system a MATLAB standalone executable that used our relevant code and toolboxes. And then we just submitted each job separately with a particular data set and the executable. And we took advantage of MATLAB's parallel uh, computing by requesting the maximum number of workers. That um, was 12 in this case. And so again, this 
help distribute the data processing load over the CPUs, which ultimately helped speed up some of the processing time. We also were lucky enough to um, uh, be able to take advantage of the long job flag because our first uh, test run showed that we were going to exceed the typical amount of time. And so the long job flag allowed us to actually run longer jobs um, once they got going. So our first set, just to give a couple of uh, bit, bits of statistics here, we completed 42 total jobs um, and uh, each job took about, on average, it's difficult to say for sure, two days to two weeks. And I'll indicate why the estimates are a little bit challenging um, later. Then we realized in, in uh, analyzing our results that the initial results were promising, but the two data analysis pipelines we tried uh, were insufficient to address some of our key questions. We had chopped the data up in such a way that we needed a little bit more um, to improve our statistical analyses. In particular, one thing we were concerned about was that our, this particular data set from an earlier study didn't contain sort of built-in controls that allowed us to do more rigorous statistical analysis. And so we reran those analyses using a newer data set that I collected that could overcome some of these limitations. And um, we had sort of similar um, numbers here, but because my new data set had um, more subjects involved, we actually successfully completed almost twice the amount of jobs. All right, finally, we had to make one last change. Uh, it turned out, again, we still uh, were lacking in data for our decomposition. So we had cut our data into 500 millisecond chunks, and it turned out for frequency uh, decomposition that we needed to increase our data size to one second chunks. We also wanted to um, combine all of our data into one single um, pipeline. So we had done different chunks of data for two different analyses. And we also wanted to add in a baseline uh, portion um, uh, to the decomposition. So the effect of this was to really increase the amount of data we were sending, which has the negative impact of increasing the amount of time it takes to do these decompositions. But ultimately, it benefits our analysis in terms of uh, having a much more rigorous statistical result. So all versions were ultimately successful and we've benefited significantly from this process. Uh, our final analysis, we obtained over 1,600 components that we're using for our data analyses, which is fantastic. Um, there were both pros and cons to this um, experience. Importantly, we had such good support along the way that we were able to uh, get this going. So that caused <laughs> basically a condensation of projected years of computing on our lab servers and machines down to just a few months per iteration of the analysis. So that was really critical. Um, but some of the jobs, as I mentioned, still took longer than necessary. And that's just due to the overall nature of our um, uh, analysis here. We knew going in, it's not really optimized for the high throughput framework. Unfortunately, we couldn't optimize it any further. Um, and one issue that we had was if a job got interrupted, which happened from time to time, it was not such that we could just restart where we left off and it had to start over. Um, and so one thing that we found was some of our few jobs seemed to be sent to like a slower or a busier machine that would get um, kicked. And unfortunately, there's not much anyone can do about that. So we just powered on through and in the end, we got all these components. But I don't wanna leave with a glum note here because it, the experience actually helped us think about a special control analysis. We were able to carry out one more analysis that was more high throughput friendly. We carried out over 100 job, uh, hundreds of jobs within a day using this uh, separate analysis. And so we had some nice control data. So just to come back to the bigger picture, um, and summarize all the, the benefits that we've had here. From the broad perspective of our research group, these resources have really significantly expanded our computational capabilities. 
Um, in particular, we're able to apply this computationally demanding but better suited analysis methods to address questions that are otherwise not well answered by more commonly used approaches. From a more focused research perspective, the resources have provided the ability to adjudicate between different possible sources of EEG findings. Um, just to return to the science briefly, what we found so far in our analyses is that the source of changes in EEG in response to the memory cues in TMS appears to be modulations of existing oscillations for anybody who's into the science. But basically, this is allowing us to help advance our field's understanding, address key questions in the grant um, that's funding the research, and it provides the opportunity to reconsider other established findings and fill in gaps in the understanding of those studies as well. And lastly, from a more personal uh, perspective, the resources have, of course, improved my skills and resume, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, I indicate I had some previous coding experience. Now I have been taught how to work with some additional languages um, and also even to optimize code. And having knowledge about and experience with these lesser known methods expands my opportunities for collaboration with other great minds. And to advertise our success, we've presented early results from these analyses in 2020, and we expect to present the latest results later this year um, at the Society for Neuroscience Conference and to write up a manuscript on the results. So with that, I wanna thank the staff and express our gratitude for the ability to rely on these resources and to thank you for taking the time to learn about our experiences to date.